Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Masonic Seminar Series. My name is Brother Katie Kumsiri, and I am your host and presenter and moderator and all things related to the Masonic Seminar Series. I want to welcome everyone from the United States and Canada, as well as around the world for those who are joining us in the Philippines and in Europe and the various places. The purpose of the Masonic Seminar Series is that it's to provide information about Freemasonry in general and universal co-masonry in particular. And why universal co-masonry? Well, that's because that is the Masonic organization for men and women that sponsors, created, and currently hosts this particular series. We found throughout the years that people who come to Masonic Seminar tend to have a better understanding about what Freemasonry is in general, why they may have a curiosity or a calling to it, without ever divulging any of our secrets so that we don't ruin the experience if you choose to knock on the door of initiation. I have in the office with me this evening, I have, as usual, Brother Patrick Alessandra, who's running our IT. We have Brother Benjamin, who is on sabbatical over the last two months. And we have Brother Jill Jones, who's with us as well as visiting. So if you hear another voice in the room that you don't recognize, that is why. Tonight, we will be talking about things that are very interesting to you specifically. We'll be talking about Freemasonry in general, and we will be answering your questions about things in particular. So get comfortable, write down your questions. Uh, we'll use the virtual hand option instead of you. We have to unmute and all that stuff just so that we have some good quality in our presentation. Traditionally, what we do in Masonic Seminar is I pick a presentation that I think would be very important for you to learn in a month, and that's what we focus on. Each presentation is separate and unique from the previous one, so that way, because we get inquires throughout the, the year, um, that way you can join in without you know missing anything. We do have this streaming on various platforms, and it will be recorded and put on Facebook and YouTube. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, Facebook and YouTube. And if you want the link to those recordings, this recording or past recordings, you can just email me and I'll be happy to get that sent to you um, as there's a lot of different information. So tonight's a little bit because every once in a while, I'd like to take a step back and just have a dialogue and talk about your questions. Um, there's some things I will front load. I'm just going to start talking. And if you have questions, raise your hand as we go. So we don't have long moments where we're staring deep into each other's eyes in awkward silence. So I'm going to start out and say, probably the number one question, maybe more from our international. So those who are outside of North America that I get is our relationship to the Illuminati. We don't have one. Um, the Illuminati is something that happened in the um, 1700s and was very brief. It burned out in, what did we, what, 15 years? Uh, yeah, 15 years. About 15 years. And anything that has come from it, at least as far as I have found in research, has been um, not of the most savory of character. We'll put it that way. So, no, we're not related to the Illuminati. If you want to be a part of the Illuminati, this is not the institution for you. You may find that I'm going to try to talk you out of joining me straight more than anything because we don't want you to come to something that you really don't want to do. So if you're looking for the Illuminati, fame, fortune, you want to be an artist of some sort, this is not the platform. What Freemasonry is in its heart is an esoteric study of the ancient mysteries and, and to uncover the questions, the existential questions of life. Um, is it dogmatic? Yes but not in the sense that you will think. Um, when we use the word dogmatic, it tends to mean more that you have to believe something specifically. Um, you know, if you're a Christian, you have to believe that Jesus is the savior. If you're a Muslim, you have to believe in Muhammad and so forth. Those are the dogmatic um, definition that most people are acquainted with. What universal co-masonry is, is a theosophical, adogmatic understanding of the Masonic philosophy. Let me break that down. And again, if you have questions at any time, feel free to raise that virtual hand option and we'll get them answered. So I'm just going to keep talking until I see hands. Uh, when we look at what that is, that theosophical a dogmatic, um, I'm going to start with the dogmatic part because that's the part we were sp speaking of. When I say that we're a dogmatic, but we have dogma, that's very confusing. Freemasonry requires on the whole, not in every obedience, but definitely in universal coming stream, that you have a belief in a supreme 
power it can be a being, it can be, a, you know, it can be Christian, it can be, you know, any type of definition that you want to put to that being, or it can be a power that which is ubiquitous and all pervasive, that type of being. That's a dogma. Now, how you describe it, that, that there's no fine point to that saying that you have to believe in this way. There are some Masonic institutions that are considered dogmatic masonry because you have to believe in a certain way. How are we theosophical? So, well, let me back up. A dogmatic just means that you don't have to have all the details exactly the same from member to member. That's why we're a dogmatic. But is there dogmatic? Yes. You have to believe in a creative power or being, and you need to believe in the the permanence of the soul. And when I, I'm going to break that sentence apart, when I say you need to believe, if you want to join universal co-masonry and you don't believe those things, you're going to find that you're not going to graft very well with what we study and the philosophy is interpretation and all that. We're not casting judgment. We're not saying you're right or wrong. If you don't believe those things, we're just saying, if you want to join and you are an atheist and you don't think that, you know, there's some creative intelligence of power, or some force that's greater than humanity, um, you're not going to feel comfortable sitting in lodge, listening to the rituals and learning about the ancient mysteries through that understanding and perspective. Um, what I mean about the permanence of the soul, it can be any type of afterlife that resonates with you. So in masonry, the, you know, when you apply and you're being interviewed and someone asks, you know, do you believe in the permanence of the soul? There's not a right answer in the sense of like, yes, I believe in reincarnation or yes, I believe that you go to heaven or hell, you know, depending on your, your personal ideology and philosophy. They're looking at does the soul continue on once the material form has ceased to exist? So that's how we're a dogmatic. We have dogma, but we're not dogmatic about how you're going to come to understand those main ideas. What a, you know, what a creator looks like, um, if anything at all. And what does the permanence of the soul look like? The theosophical part. So in the title, Theosophical, A Dogmatic Freemasonry. So theosophical asserts that there is an ancient perennial wisdom that um, through space and time, at one point was whole, and through time and space has broken apart and has deviated into the various uh, different spiritual traditions and religions. Every religion has some truth in it somewhere in some aspect or has a variation of that. Freemasonry or universal co-masonry asserts that there is an ageless wisdom that exists. Again, how you come to that is really on your own, um, your own path of study and discovery. So that's the theosophical part, and there's more to it, but you're looking at the study of wisdom. You're looking at that, trying to go back and interpolate, so go backwards in time to really understand the source of all things. And the beauty of having the theosophical and the egg dogmatic come together is that it allows unity and diversity. And I don't say that to be a catchy phrase. I say it because it's genuine. There's lots of different people in universal co-masonry that have lots of different backgrounds. And we're able to sit in lodge and to talk about maybe topics that you would find um, some hostility towards in maybe more public circles. And you will find that they're able to sit in their differences and unite in their belief. I don't know if that makes sense. It does in my head. So if it doesn't, just ask me to clarify it. But when we look at that theosophical adogmatic Freemasonry, it shows how we're all trying to go back to the source together without trying to um, force you to believe in something you don't already believe in. So the third part of the name, Freemasonry, if you look at the etymology of Freemasonry or where the word comes from, um, there's a lot of different sources, but most of them take you back to the idea that Freemasonry means sons of light. And when I say sons, I'm not talking about a sex. I'm not talking about biology. I'm talking about mankind. So all men and women across the globe, no matter what your biology is, we are all sons of light. So we're looking at a very interesting, heavy name that has uh, three pieces to it that has a lot of information packed into what we are. If any of that does not sound like it's something that you, you know, jive well with, then this may not be for you. Um, if that's something that piques your interest and says, well, you know, I want to learn more, 
you know, stay on and, and we can have a further conversation. But I'd like to stop and see if there's any questions about anything I've said so far. You can throw it in the chat or you can raise your hand and we can get those questions and asked, um, excuse me, asked and answered. So please don't be shy because I get really bored listening to myself. And I'm sure Brother Patrick does too. All right. <laughs> um, do you want to go ahead? Um, do you want to go ahead and unmute Brother Christine? Brother Christine, it's all you. Oh, thank you, Brother Katie and Brother Patrick and everybody. Welcome. Um, when you were talking, it made me think. Brother Christine, just one second. My my speaker's not working, so just one moment. Okay. When you were talking, it made me think about the the pronouns that are going around Hi, now. And Hi, how Patrick. Does, Hi, Patrick. And how does that impact on Freemasonry and how we how we speak about Freemasonry. Will that change in the future? Will we move from sons of light and mankind to some other pronouns or some other use of the words? Thank you, Brother Christine. Um, I'm glad you asked because this is a question that's even on our application for those who have seen it or haven't seen it. One of the questions we asked right up front is, do you have a problem being called brother? Because as you know, I said, brother Jill, I said, brother Patrick, I said, brother Christine, it doesn't matter what sex someone is um, or gender, we call everyone brother. And that is not going to change. Uh, there is a long history of where that name comes from. And despite modernity and its present understanding of what that word means, Brother is very, very ancient um, in its source and roots. And when we look at the actual historical movement in universal co-masonry, um, back when we were united with Le Drachimon in France, we had several prominent figures, such as uh, Brother Annie Passant, C.W. Leadbeater, and so forth, who were co-masons. And if you look back in some of their earlier publications, you'll see that the title kind of flips back and forth between you know, Brother Annie Besant or Sister Annie Besant. And at some point, there is a movement within the, the order to go be called brother by, you know, everyone's called brother. And that was a movement that was instigated and initiated by the female Masons within the order. That was not something that came from our male counterparts. It was something that, um, was very much important for the members in the early 19, late 1800s, 1900s to have that uh, title be changed. And so you'll see at some point there's a very distinctive time. I'm not quite sure the, the date on that when it flips from Sisters Besant to it's everyone's brother. That's a historical that's modern. Um, when we look at the ancient roots, we're looking at brother being, again, it's not, it's not saying that we're all bi you know, biologically have male organs, sexual organs, or my gametes are not male because I can call brother. It's speaking to the spirit of a thing. So when we look at masonry, masonry is feminine as an idea, as an archetype. So Freemasonry is female in, in all of her aspects. And its memberships is considered masculine in all of its energetic aspects. So not only do you have a historical push for it, you have an ancient um, source for its being, but you also have a spiritual connection between the two. So universal co-masonry will not change to, you know, some people want frere and soir, which is just brother and sister in French. They want um, siblings. Sibling is a new innovation. It's, I think it was um, early 1900s, you can check me on that, but it was in the last 150 years that sibling came out as an actual word to be used. But Freemasonry and universal Freemasonry, we will not be changing that. So if that bothers you, if that does not sit well, that's okay. We may not be the organization for you, but if it is something that you can understand at a different level and possibly in a higher plane of consciousness, then you can understand why we would keep that together. And the other interesting thing is that this is not going to be popular, and I'm sure I'm going to have people who will be very mad at me, and that's okay. You don't have to like me. Um, the winds of modernity aren't here forever, and the tides will change, and society will want something else. And if Freemasonry is constantly bending her knee and bending her back over, it will be broken to the wants of society, and it will lose all its authenticity. That is not to say that maybe modernity is correct in how it's perceiving gender as a, a spectrum. 
It's not saying that. It's not saying that it's right either. It's just saying when you are an occult student, you understand that there are two creative forces in the universe. It is masculine and it is feminine. And that as Masons, we're not looking at the material form, that I am female and I have female gametes. We're looking at the fact that we are spiritual entities trying to reach the pinnacle of divine hermaphroditism so that we can embrace what it means to really be servants of the light. So there is a completely higher level to that. I'm going to go to Brother Elio. It's so nice to see you. I haven't seen you in a while. I thought I saw your hand up. Um, if you don't mind me, me calling on you. And we're going to get you unmuted here. Yes. Okay. Brother Elio, if you want to go ahead and unmute yourself. No, I was, I was just going to mention, you know, this uh, this terminology, you know, brothers and mankind, um, that if we go to the original Proto-Germanic meaning of the word man, man means people. And the reason woman, the 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 that that uh, prefix wo ma man is a person of the feminine sex, woman. So man, that's what man means uh, traditionally uh, and and uh, etymologically, it's a person and it has been regarded as meaning humankind, all the people in the world up to the 1200s and it has continued like that. So if you go back to the origin of the word etymologically, that's what it means. The same way like brother as a title, you know, man, mankind um, means people. Actually, any, any people, as you just mentioned, regardless of uh, of uh, gender. That's Thank all you. I wanted to say. Thank no, you. that's that's beautiful. Thank you, and I'm I'm glad you said that because some of the times when I come into something in masonry, and I'm like, you know, this is a word that I have a hard time with, or I struggle with maybe what I'm trying to understand that, that degree is trying to teach me. I always start with the root and origin of the word. That always helps me because I have come to understand how language develops and how it is a living system, unless you're Latin, you know, or you're already a dead language, it's constantly moving by the tides of society. So words that like peruse today, when we use the word peruse as an example, it means today to just gloss over. But if you really look at what the word meant, it meant to go and study in deep. So words have even changed within one's lifetime. So when I struggle with a word, like someone's, man, I, I'm just not, I don't like being called brother. I would highly recommend go start and look at the history of where that word came from. And you will probably, we would say more than likely than not, be very surprised that the word doesn't mean what you thought it mean or what society thinks it means. It actually has a very ancient origin to it. Language is fascinating if you ever delve into that. So thank you, Brother Elio. Uh, Brother Patrick. Uh, so I've got two questions, one from YouTube and one from the chat. Okay, give me one from YouTube. Uh, so Dow asks, what is the relationship between Masonry and Kabbalah? Mm. Masonry and Kabbalah. So I may actually have to defer to Brother Elio on this because he's more of an expert than I am. And I want to be very uh, honest in my knowledge with you. Um, when we look, I can give you the historical piece. When you may be looking at the esoteric, you know, Brother Elio, I don't want to throw you under the bus or on the spot, but maybe we can defer that question to him um, as he is more knowledgeable in that than I. But when we look at the, the bedrock of what is now currently modern Freemasonry, it starts in the Western esoteric tradition. So it's one of the five traditions, and Kabbalah is going to be one of the sciences that also comes out of that time. So they run parallel, and they cross over, and they have a lot of interactions. There's symbols that we have in Lodge are, that one goes over the other. The deepness of that, though, I'm going to turn over to Brother Elio. Um, if you want to add anything, and you can tell me you don't want to talk to, because I just threw you on the spot. Um, but if you have any insight on that, Brother Elio, that would be great if you could share that with us. Well, uh, you know, the Kabbalah is just the, uh, is a, is a, well, it means tradition. So uh, technically, that's the, what the meaning of the word is tradition. It's tradition. So it is the esoteric tradition, a Jewish esoteric tradition from a Jewish point of view and um, developed, um, well, there is a traditional history that um, and that there is a more historical uh, perspective that it actually is spread about the 
14th century and the you know southern southern in Spain and, and southern France. Uh, but that's that is the esoteric tradition of the, of the Jewish people. Um, and I and as probably you, you mentioned that Freemasonry kind of syncretistic. There are, it involves all esoteric traditions. Uh, that's only one of them among the several mm -hmm. to, that Freemasonry also uh, encompasses. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Elio. And some of those other traditions are going to be um, astrology. When I say astrology, I'm tying that to astronomy because back in the day, they were one science. Uh, you have alchemy. And then the other one is magic. And I want to talk a little bit before we get to Brother Maya and back to Brother Christine on what I say by magic, because either there's usually two interpretations of magic, or I guess not interpretations. I would say reactions when that word comes out there's either the idea that it is something that is you know very lunar and you're conjuring up spirits and you're pulling together you know energies from a, a, the night you know from the nighttime on um, if you will or you have the complete like oh my gosh that's hocus pocus that's weird about i don't like it i don't want anything to do with it so when i use the word magic i don't mean either one of those i mean something entirely different um it is very very well known by the occult students that there is the physical world and there is the metaphysical meta being outside of outside of the physical world and these two worlds have an interaction and they aren't just running parallel they're very much woven one within the other much like the spirit is woven into the body and magic is when i talk about ceremonial magic and i'm talking about the western esoteric tradition i'm talking about Again, those creative forces, the masculine and the feminine, amongst other forces that are brought together for the creation. Now, that creation, depending on the practitioner, would be for good or for ill. And in masonry, that energy is through ritual work. So it's ceremonial magic. It's bringing all of the energies that every one of us exudes and brings it together to create something that is greater than the sum of, or greater than the parts it is greater than, and that's what I mean by magic. So if you had either an adverse reaction or a very pagan perspective of what I meant by that, and it's very different. I just want to make that clear. Thank you, Brother Elio. Brother Maya, it's good to see you. Hold on one second. Patrick needs 10, ten hands. Oh, I am. I am clicked her. I apologize. I won't do that next time. All right. All right. You're good, brother mine. Okay. Thank you. Um, I was curious. I was going back to this idea of dogmatic versus a dogmatic, and I was wondering, you know, this idea that there is an ageless wisdom, or there's truths, and that there might be more than one approach to them. And that that is something that different people find their way to and have their own path on. But there's also sort of things that the order chooses to use as techniques or tools also to help that maybe are specific. So is it entirely up to the individual to find their path to truth or there is there also not so much prescribed, but recommended or strongly urged, or there's sort of a group consensus that we're going to try this way, or it's just built into the system to be that way. If that's mm -hmm. not too confusing a way to ask the question. <laughs> I'm good with confusing. Um, so there's, I'm going to bifurcate my answer on that, um, because I would say the prescribed method that's built into the system is ritual. That's the number one way to help you find your path. As I said earlier, there have been some things I have learned in masonry through my studies that I was like, I just it's like it just doesn't sit on me well. I don't, you know, I'm I have intellectual humility enough to say that I'm probably wrong, especially if you look at hermetics and we talk about all truth is but a half truth. And I I often joke that if I even had an eighth of a truth, I'd be in a good sitting, but I always feel like I'm wrong all the time. So I'm like, well. Let's just make the assumption that I'm not right. And this isn't fitting on me. I need to work through this. And ritual helps you enact things over and over and over again because it brings things out of you that you may not have been aware of that you had and makes you, if you choose to, face it. Um, and I've had conversations with other people like, well, what do you mean? And people I trust, I didn't just like pick the next person you know, to me and say, hey, what do you think? You know, 
I sought out the counsel of those who are my elders in masonry, who have been in the degree or had had um, a lot of experience with that particular part of the ritual. And I said, you know, tell me what you understand or tell me where to go that I might understand. And the conversation has really helped. But eventually I had to I had to come to my own understanding. And and unfortunately, I have in those areas where it was something that I could work on. But it was the ritual that constantly kept bringing it back up. I couldn't just tuck it away into the swamp and never see the swamp monster come out again. It was something that was there. So that's, that's the one side of the answer. The group consensus, I mean, <laughs> as many masons there are, multiply it in that, you know, by four, and that's how many opinions you have in the room. So, you know, group consensus, I don't know. I don't know if there's a group consensus. But what I would say, and this is something that seems to be difficult right now in our societies, globally speaking, is you need to talk to people who are on the other side of an understanding because you can't know if you are on the path or not if you don't know what's around you. And so I will purposely sit down and talk to someone who believes entirely different than I am, not to convince them, not necessarily to be convinced. I might walk away convinced depending on how valid and great their argument is, is rather, um, but talking to people and asking questions and questions that are meaningful. Nothing is more aggravating to get a question that you really don't mean or you're asking it for someone else because you know they're wrong and they don't know they're wrong. Like that's aggravating. Asking questions that are genuine and authentic and being open to hearing what the answer might be, even if you don't like it. Not everything, not every road leads to Rome. You know, if Rome is the, the pinnacle city that all people are going to, if you will. Not every road leads to Rome. So it's not that just go do whatever. It's, there's a lot of individual path, but you you need brothers, you need community, you need something to help you along the way because oftentimes you will trip and fall because there's a lot of obstacles, especially as you start looking at such things that are as um, important and something that is so fundamentally a part of existence. There's, we have to strip away all of our perceptions that we have tacked on, whether it's through um, our own doing or just being passive and allowing someone else to do it to us. Like we have to strip those things away and see truth for what truth is presenting itself as. And that is, I liken it to the Ark of the Covenant in Indiana Jones. You know, you open it up and your face melts, you know, and it's like, you don't know what to do. And so you have to have brothers who put you back together again and say, you know, this, what did you see? What did you feel? What did you experience? And having that conversation, having that community is, is essential because I can't go to work and say that to my colleagues because they'll, they won't respect it in the way that I mean it. So that's where I bifurcate my answer. I would say that you have ritual, which is built into the system. And then I would say conversation and active engagement with the knowledge that you're, you're in with, um, ask questions, meditate or pray. It doesn't matter which path you choose on that. They both work like use what you have. You have tools, but the, um, the number one thing that I would recommend out of all that is you have to be open to being wrong because a high percentage is that you probably are just like the rest of us because our perception isn't the truth. It's just a perception of the truth. It's much like Plato looking, you know, in his cave analogy, uh, looking at the shadows isn't the truth of a thing. It's the casting of that truth and that shadow can change. And we have to go find the objects and be open to being wrong. So having that humility and grace to, to be wrong, which for some of us, myself included, can be very, very difficult. So I, I hope that helps. Uh, let's go to Brother Christine and then we'll go to Victor. Thank you, Brother Katie. Um, I guess my question, and you keep bringing it up, so I'm going to go back there. I was wondering if there was any books, and since we were talking about gender, I was thinking of the book of the Kabbalion, and how beneficial is that for people who are coming in or wishing to be a part of Freemasonry? Um, if you ever want book recommendations, myself and Brother Matthias and many of the brothers here have an, you know, a very extensive list of any time we tend to choose fiction more than nonfiction, though we have that as well, um, because fiction is how the human mind learns deeper truths and facts are always based on current understanding. Um, you know, so when we talk about gravity, it's been upgraded since Newton's time uh, to mean something different. And it wasn't that Newton was wrong. It just means we got more information. So the facts were updated and that's not bad. That's just 
the nature of, you know, dealing with the material world. Um, so when you talked about, Brother Christine, about the Kabbalion, the Kabbalion is a really good, I wouldn't even say it's like a, a good starter read. It's a good read to do whenever. Like there's, I've read it several times over my years, but it's, it's good to start out if you're like, I just don't know where to go. Go to the Kabbalion. It's not going to talk about in Freemasonry, we do this. Doesn't doesn't even mention Freemasonry. I don't even think that word's anywhere in the book. But what it has, because Hermeticism is a part of that Western esoteric tradition where Freemasonry is born out of, um, it has a lot of similar principles. One of the favorite principles I hear often, especially when um, we have our, you know, we have, what is it, triannual workshops? Is that how you say that? Triannual we have uh, workshops here every three, you know, three times a year for the various degrees. And one principle that I hear all the time is the law of correspondence, which is very elegantly um, illustrated in the Kabbalion. And it's, you know, as above, so below, as within, so without. And excuse me, in that type of um, principles, it's very basic and it gives it very straightforward. So if you're like, you know, I struggle with the idea of gender on whatever size you believe the argument, that's a good place to start because the occult student doesn't say there's a spectrum of gender in energy. I'm not talking a human being. Okay. I'm not saying that there are or not. I'm not standing on my side. Okay. But the occult student says there's a masculine energy and there's a feminine energy. And they have characteristics that are unique and specific to each. And that you need both of them to create. You will see that motif in many of the esoteric traditions. Alchemy would be an example of that. You have the alchemical marriage. You have the white queen and the red king coming together to create, you know, not quite yet in the whole alchemical process, but you're you're almost still creating the philosopher's stone, that, that stone which every alchemist is trying to seek for. You can't get there unless you have the marriage of opposites. So the Kabbalion is a great place to start if you're really wondering what to do. It's also a good place to come back to because it allows you to remember what it is. And then once you get comfortable with the Kabbalion, you can go look at all the other hermetic texts, which are really challenging to read. But if you have some footholding, you can get through um, more of the older pieces from Hermes Trace Majestus or Toth, who is said to have written those documents. So um, if you want book recommendations, you can email me. I can, I'll ask you, I'll literally just be like, tell me what type of what, you, what are you looking for? Um, and then I can steer you more into um, a particular book. Another book I would read, um, and I'm going to go to Victor here in a second. And this one I read quite a bit, um, is The Brother of the Third Degree. It's a story. It's very Masonic in its story. Again, it doesn't talk about Freemasonry explicitly. Um, but it is a, a good depiction of the path of an initiate. And the sacrifices that may come to an initiate in its various forms. Um, one person I knew read it and was like, this is really weird. And I'm like, well, then maybe masonry is not for you because it is about occult studies. And if you're if your mind really isn't into that, really doesn't jive well with that, then it's it's going to be a rough ride. Not that you can't do it. It's just going to take a little bit more work to get more familiar. Um I think those would be the two books. There's a lot of other ones and I could spend a whole seminar on books and we could talk about books, but I don't think we need to, but send me an email, tell me what you're looking for and I can get you settled in and tell me what you've read. So that way I know like not to give you the Kabbalion if you haven't read that. Okay. Uh, Victor. Good evening. Good evening. Thanks. I want to um, to comment on this corridor, and it's a usual thing, nothing exclusive. But I just so happen to um, to be inclined in structures, so to speak, or sociological imagination is what I intend to um, to pretend, if you will, here about the corridor, um, the courage here. Okay, and how I say it, um, it is expanded uh, over um, the time uh, since the last one, and um, that's in in uh, regards to how um, the educational prejudice, if you will, is uh, dealt with or uh, transposed, more or less. 
um, in uh, in tandem with correspondence and uh, the interconnected uh, league, if you will, legion. Uh, uh, Masonry. Um, that is that I like the way that uh, the uh, society um, deals with reality as well, uh, and especially the ritual. Okay, um, um, it has you know this society, female, male, and, and that's obvious. And so I think that's that's important to be able to kind of um, muffle what the cloud is for uh, for um, uh, agile purposes, if you will. Um, and so, you know, I commend you and, and, uh, and congratulations on uh, registering your title this time again. Uh, that's important in my opinion because across the uh, online community, many hosts are not registering his or her title. And that's got a lot to do with our questions. And uh, these, uh, these uh, among the legends we, we are in philosophy, uh, because broadcast is really important, we're online, and people who want to watch and aren't attending would like, I imagine, for entertainment purposes, to not see the actual uh, congregation on the screen, rather some, some broadcast. And it takes personality to do that. Um, it can't be just by the book or verbatim to be on screen as well. So thank you, uh, thank you, Victor, for that. Very and, nice. and that's 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 it. Thanks. Thank you. Um, one thing I want to bring up. Oh, we had another question. We got two. Jill oh, we got two questions in the office. Chat, so. All right, brother Jill. Uh, Brother Katie, I just wanted to um, kind of piggybacking off what Victor said there about ritual. Um, could you talk more about the ritual side of obviously not giving anything away, but the ritual side and the discipline that is necessary? Yeah, I can do that. Yeah. Um, so if, maybe if you didn't hear Brother Jill, um, she was asking about the ritual side since Victor brought that up, um, you know, piggybacking off of what he was saying. Talk about a little bit about the ritual side without obviously divulging certain things and um, the discipline with it. So I'm going to start with the second half of what she asked, which is the discipline component. Freemasonry requires a lot of discipline, but it's discipline of the body is where it starts. And I have somewhere in my library, I don't know where it's at. Um, it's called the, the um, Power of Habit, which I don't read any self-help books, but for some reason I picked this up, I don't know, 12 years ago. Um, and in it, they talked about, just to kind of give you a preface, because this is related to what we're talking about, there was some statistics or some research, rather, that was done on high-flying individuals like CEOs and owners of companies, people who are really kind of high up on the ladder um, of leadership and how they, some of them have started at really low points in their life. And what did they have to change in order to get so far up? And the number one thing I took away from that book was something called the Keystone Habit. Now, when they looked at these individuals, they were looking, researchers were looking for like that big change. Like I quit smoking, you know, that revolutionized my life. Um, I'm not a smoker, but I, I understand from what I've been told how extremely difficult that is for most people. Um, that's a big change. A keystone habit is actually a small change, but it is an essential change that causes the landslide, if you will, or, you know, an avalanche to change. So an example, um, this is a very mundane example but that was in the book where um, someone, you know, they were a little bit heavier. They weren't very um, well fit. And instead of going to the gym every, you know, say I'm going to get up at every morning and go at five o'clock, which, you know, no one in God's green earth wants to get up at five o'clock and go do an hour worth of working out. Like that just doesn't sound good to us. Right? We'd rather sleep in. Um, instead of doing that and then being discouraged every day, which just feeds the cycle of getting bigger and bigger because, you know, you start feeling bad and then you comfort yourself in whatever way and gain more weight and so forth. What this person did was they decided that when they were um, at work, they worked in a cubicle, that when they decided that they were hungry, they would usually go across to the other cubicle and start talking to their friend and they would have a snack and they'd eat a lot and, you know, and then come back. What they did is they decided to go with their friend on a walk around their building for the 15 minutes they had a break and then go and sit down. And that one change actually revolutionized their whole life. 
they lost, they lost a lot of weight. They felt happy. They then started perpetuating them in the right direction. So it wasn't this massive change. It was just a small change, but it was the right change. So how does that relate to discipline and ritual? Discipline is a keystone habit to living a life in the light and service. Because if you don't want to be disciplined, then you're not wanting to be of service because we don't get to choose how we serve. We have to serve the way that we're called to by the universe for humanity. You know, I'd like to be rich and famous and think that serves everyone's benefit, but it doesn't. You know, I have to have the discipline to do the hard things, but that doesn't come without me having the discipline to do the easy things. And so in masonry, it starts you out with just very simple physical discipline. Like you can't just talk whenever you want. You can't just leave whenever you want. There's certain etiquettes that are very simple and sometimes a little trying, um, depending on your background and how disciplined it was. And then over time and through ritual, you get to those big items that are maybe that would have been really hard for you. And they're not as hard because you started out very small with the keystone habit. And so you learn to train yourself through time and dedication and effort and ritual to finally get to those maybe more daunting physical disciplines that you wouldn't have been successful at because it's very hard to start at the top of the mountain when you're at the bottom. So you have to work your way up. That bleeds over into spiritual discipline. Freemasonry will only ask a physical discipline so that you have the liberty and freedom of thought to think what you need to think to find the truth. No one's going to unzip your head and tell you what you have to believe. They will give you the historical background. They will give you ritualistic context. They will ask you questions. They may even give you their opinion if you're so lucky. But they will never turn around and say, Brother Patrick, you're wrong. That is completely unmasonic. And if I, I never heard, no, I've heard one person say that. And the eldest brother in the room turned around and said, no, brother, you're wrong. We don't say that. You, Everyone's entitled to their, their position and perspective in life. So that discipline is really important on the physical sense so that you can have the spiritual and mental discipline to achieve the knowledge as an occult student and and understand what service truly looks like. Um, I would say when it comes to ritual, the one thing that the head of our order and the masters of the lodges, which are the people who run the lodges around the world, The one thing that they are an authority on is ritual. So if you're doing something in the ritual, and we all do the same ritual, it doesn't matter the language. If you're doing something in ritual that is not correct, the master will tell you, you are not correct. And you will fix it according to what is correct. That's the discipline. But if you say, I think in this part of the ritual, it means this, and this is what I've come to understand it. The master is not going to tell you, you are wrong. Even if they disagree with you, like on a personal level, they won't tell you you're wrong. They may challenge you and say, well, tell me why you think that, or where did, where did you come from? Because I totally see it this way. And because even though you're new and they're a master, they're, they're going to tell you how ritual is done, but your opinions, your right to an opinion, I should say, is equal. Now, they may have more information, which makes their opinion maybe more, um, I don't want to say valid, but more informed is probably the better word, more informed. So they might, they, they should hopefully be more informed, um, but you're still both entitled to your opinion. And oftentimes I've heard the head of our order, someone will ask them um, a question, you know, what do, what do you think this means? And I've heard her refuse because she, you know, she doesn't want anyone to take what she says as dogma and that you have to believe what she says. Or she will preface and say, in my opinion, this is what I think. And then you're at liberty to say, well, why? Can you tell me? You know, so there is that there's that exchange between that is fair. But there is that discipline in the ritual and how it has to be done. I'm going to take it one step further and then I'll stop to see if there's any questions um, because I think we have another question, right? Keep forgetting that one question. I don't want to. Um, I'm going to take it from a scientific standpoint. A lot of people will say in the occult communities, the esoteric communities, you can do it. You can do any ritual any way you want. Like it's just you just have to kind of figure it out yourself. Well, in the land of chemistry, that's a bad idea. Because there are set ways you do things. So if you are pouring water into an acid, it will blow up in your hands because it's an exothermic reaction. That's the wrong way to do it, unless you don't want your hand and you want it to melt off. I'm being a little bit dramatic. Um, But if you take the acid and you pour it into the water, it's fine. 
rituals like that. There are certain ways that you have to do it because that is the way that you, going back to ceremonial magic, that is the way you properly set up the, the space in which you're working to do the work that is for the light. Not that if you do something wrong that it automatically goes bad. I'm not saying that. It just means being active or inert or not non-effective. So keep that in mind. There's a lot of uh, idea in this world that's like, do whatever you want. Um, no, that's, I mean, we don't even say that to our children because that's just a bad idea in general. Like you, there are rules and you have to understand what those rules are. So you have to have the discipline of study. You have to have the discipline of ritual so that you can ultimately have the outcome that you are trying to achieve. Brother Jill, did I answer that question? That was, yeah, I think that's beautiful. Thank you. Okay, good. Brother Patrick, and then we'll go to Devin. All right. So Barb Stanton in the chat uh, asks, um, well, I have been watching many of these seminars in which to apply. How does the belief that uh, in a yin and yang being and the concept of reincarnation and that you eventually pass to a higher plane of existence fit with Freemasonry? I would counter. Do I need to repeat that question? Did you guys hear it? You're all good. Okay. One. Um, I would counter and say, how does it not fit with Freemasonry? Um, ultimately, Freemasonry is working with the supreme will and evolution. And all of those letters are capitalized. That's the time. The supreme will and evolution. We are working with the idea of trying to get humanity as a collective to its destiny. Not saying I know what destiny is, but I think it's pretty good. So we're trying to get everyone there and we're all going to do it our own ways. And I'm not, Barb, I'm not very familiar with the yin and yang um, body. I can kind of infer. I don't really know what you mean by that. So I don't, I'm not going to address that because I don't want to misspeak on that. Um, but when you look at reincarnation, and ultimately, it's really, when I say it's the same, I don't mean it's like the same doctrinal belief, but it's the same idea that, oh, you know, if you die and you go to heaven, or if you die and you go to hell, depending on how you believe it, that you're ultimately trying to get better. So reincarnation is going to be more, you know, a cyclical path, if you will, ascending upward, and, you know, dying after this life. You're not going to be the same person in this life in the, as you are in the afterlife, which is hopefully an evolution, not an involution, which is going down. That would be a permanence of the soul. So even though yours is a very specific question, that idea fits with the, uh, the notion of the permanence of the soul. So you may have a more detailed understanding of it, but it fits very well. And ultimately, the purpose of ritualistic magic is not only to have um, to create space to, to for the service of humanity under the the banner of the great architect but it's also to, to help elevate our consciousness we're all not at the same consciousness i know a lot of people don't like that but there's lots of people who are way more in tune and vibrate at a totally different level than i do and ritual helps me elevate myself so that i can have a better understanding of how to serve to lift myself out of my base needs of you know wanting you know self-aggrandizement to be the center of everything to do me 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 it gets me out of that and it starts to elevate me into higher and higher understanding for consciousness and allows me to be a more effective tool in the service and promotion of humanity's best interest so I, I hope that answers the majority of your question. Um, I don't know if Brother Patrick, if there's anything else in the chat on that. Okay. Um, Barb, feel free to send me an email and just tell me what you mean by the yin and yang. And like I said, I can maybe infer what that means, but I don't necessarily want to misunderstand. Thank you for your question. Uh, Devin. I think this is working now. I apologize. Yeah. Um, firstly, nice to meet you and good to see you again, Brother Patrick. So um, being military, it goes sort of uh, hand in hand with ritual, drill and ceremony. Um, we have our own, you know, like you said, it's only one way to do it. Or if you're wrong, I'll let you know. Um, and with, um, you know, being Jewish, same thing. You know, I guess ritual goes hand in hand with what you believe in. Um, you know, Hashem, God, the architect of all things, tells you, you know, through mikvah, we do our own ritual, um, you know, how to eat, you know, what to eat, um, and whatnot. And there's certain practices that we do. And I guess it's a better way to put it into the Bible or I guess whatever you believe in, um, you know, how you can relate physically and spiritually and mentally. And then like the military, you expand and, you know, grow and get, I guess, same thing with 
uh, Freemasonry, you have, you start out, you know, brand new, you don't know anything, and then you, you learn more, and you, what you learn becomes everyday practice, and then it just becomes habit. Then you just expand, grow, and then you learn, and I guess ritual through that ritual and ceremony, you can connect. So, yeah, that I, makes I, sense in a way. Yeah, it does make sense, and I would agree with it. The only difference is there's less yelling masonry than I think in the military. Yeah. Um, <laughs> True. So, I don't think I've ever been yelled at, though. So, but outside of that, everything else is exactly the same in the sense of, you know, you have to practice it and you have your betters showing you how to do it because I'm not necessarily saying that they're better as a human being. They just, they're better in their understanding of what you're trying to do. So they're trying to get you to make it not only muscle memory, but like spirit memory to make sure that it sits in all the levels so that then you can open yourself up and be more aware of what you need to do. So very, very similar. Great analogy. Thank you, Devin. Brother Aurora. One second. There you are. Hi, Brother Katie. I have two questions for you. Uh, The first question is, what is Mason Bree's position on Thelemic magic? And my second question is, what is Mason Bree's position on brothers seeking to participate in other fraternal organizations in addition to universal co-masonry? So great question. It depends. Now, I know that's not the greatest answer because it's, people want more cut and dry. Thelema and Thelemic magic, um, we tend to be more cautious with, um, especially if we get individuals who are in Thelema who want to apply to masonry. We're a little more cautious. Um, The style and method in which they interact with the metaphysical world is not something that universal co-masonry necessarily endorses. Um, So I would say approach with caution uh, on that one. And it's not like a hard and fast rule, like, oh, if you're in the lima, you're done. You You can never join us. It's not it at all. But there's when you apply and you disclose that you're in Thelema, the brothers that will interview you will talk heavily and extensively about it. Um, and the best option on that is just be honest, because if it's not compatible, it's not compatible. You don't want to blend two paths together that don't work because it won't blend. Um, so there's not a hard and fast on that. But I would say case by case, and I would say more often than not, we have found that it's not compatible um, in just the way that one method approaches the ancient mysteries compared to what we do as our own method to brothers within the order who want to join other fraternal organizations that has to be done um, disclosure to the master of the lodge. And that then is taken to the head of the order. Um, And that is because we are very mindful of all the different obediences and different styles of occult magic and interaction. Um, you may have to make a choice or you may be able to do both. It just depends um, on what it is. I can't give you like a definite, but you do disclose that. And that is not because it's like, well, if you do that, you have to leave. That might be an option. Like if you're like, I'm going to go do the golden dawn. Well, then you're going to have to make a choice because nine out of 10 times, that's not compatible. Those are two completely different paths. And it's fine. Like if you choose to go do the golden dawn over universal right? There's there's no hard feelings. But what we would say is, you know, you need to be open about what you're doing because this is a very, um, this isn't the physical world, which we're all familiar. You walk outside, uh, outside the Grand Canyon and off the wall, you're going to fall, right? That happens to every one of us. No one's exempt of that particular rule. We, like we get the physical. The metaphysical is much, much harder and has very different ways of being interacting with the physical. So when you start blending multiple paths together and you start doing it because, you know, that's what you're called, you feel called to do and you're not telling people that you're doing it, then you put yourself in danger. So the order, you you can do it. You just have to ask permission. And I know some people don't like it, but then, hey, you don't have to join it. Don't like it. Um, or you can choose, you know, to join it and not be a part of universal commissary, or it may be a perfect blend and everything's fine. It just, it just depends. Perfect blend would be Rosicrucianism. I have met many brothers who are Rosicrucians and Masons, many brothers who are Martinists and Masons. Those tend to follow the same path. Um, I see brothers who have struggled um, specifically with Golden Dawn, specifically with the Lima and Masonry. They tend to work in very different spheres. So it's not that there's, you know, one path and one path only. You just need to be very communicative. Brother Aurora, did I answer your question? Okay. 
Is there any other questions um, before I start talking about all sorts of fun stuff? What else do I need to talk about? Because I can I can talk for hours. I promise. Him. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that's a gift or a curse for you guys. Um, other important things. Uh, <clears throat> there's just so much. Um, is there anything else that I need to say that's essential before I get to more technical stuff? Um, the requirements for joining co-masonry. Okay. That's a good place to start. Requirements for joining co-masonry. Um, outside of the dogmas of uh, belief in a higher power and the permanence of the soul. And for some people who may be Masons and are like, we don't have dogma, or people are like, we are Masons and we're not dogmatic. Um, I would refer you to Albert Pike's book called Morals or Dogma. What is it? Morals. Yeah, Morals and Dogma. I always put it too. Morals and Dogma. And that's not from our obedience. That's from another obedience. So, I mean, it's not something that we just made up. Um, dogma does exist. Dogma is not a bad word unless you, you yourself don't do what you're supposed to do and understand what dogma is. I don't know if that makes sense, but I digress. Um, requirements. So when you look at masonry, I'm going to just talk about universal co-masonry because every obedience is different. depends on what continent you're on. It depends what type of masonry you're part of. Um, so it all, it's all very different. The starting place for universal co-masonry is first very basic. You got to be at least 21 years old. If you are not you have to have had a parent who is a Mason. And that means you can apply at 18, though you have different requirements of what age you can progress into um, the different degrees. If you come in as a Lewis, as we call him, Brother Jill's a Lewis, actually. Uh, her parents were Masons and um, Brother Matthias was a Lewis as well. And many other brothers. Well, you're, you're kind of a Lewis. <laughs> kind of are. Right, so I'll give it to Brother Matt. He's a Lewis too. We'll let him have it. Um, so you, you have to be 21 years old. That's like the very physical, like literal concrete answer. Um, and I think the more spiritual component is going to be the most important, which is you have to be of mature spiritual age. That doesn't have an age limit on it, right? The worst thing in the world is when you're talking about deep esoteric truths and questions is to have someone in the room who is making it bathroom or just being completely inappropriate and making everything a joke. And like, that's not correct. So when we look at maturity and mature age, yes, you have the physical age of 21. We're also looking at a mental maturity um, because that can be all, no matter what our age is physically, that is very different from person to person. So someone, or and it's not even that they'll just make everything into a joke. It could be that they just don't understand. Like they just haven't accrued the information to really understand what you're talking about. And that's not to say you can never join masonry. It just means we need to get you to more Masonic seminars, more philosophical societies, get you reading books, writing out your thoughts, conversing. You can be brought up if you feel like, man, I don't, I just don't know. I don't know enough. Um, don't worry. That's something that can um, be assisted in development. Sound judgment and strict morals. Um, that's the second and third uh, requirement. Strict morals is a tricky one. I always like to go to the second one and not the first. I don't know why I do that. I mean, it's because I am dyslexic and I just flip things. I don't know. Um, so when we look at morals, masonry asserts that there is an objective reality, that there is good and there is evil. Okay, you can define that any way you want. That there is, you can call it light and dark if you don't like good and evil. You can call it that positive and negative. It, it doesn't matter the name in which it goes by. There is that which brings everyone together, reunites us all with the source, regular, right? Or it's that which divides. It's that which is chaotic and is just destroying things and making, you know, hyper individuation so when we look at being individual especially in the west we love our individuality like don't you know don't tread on me i don't like it hyper individuation flies in the face of unity and when we look at morals freemasonry is a moral system and so when you are you have a system of morality or you're um a amoral or immoral depending on how you look at it that separates people. And so you may have a system of morality that may not be conducive with masonry. You know, we venerate virtue, we venerate service, we venerate humanity and like humanitarian effort. And that doesn't mean like 
go dig a ditch or build a house. I'm talking about service and kindness in relationships with those that you interact with, whether you know them or are intimate with them or family with them. Uh, <clears throat> Morals is a boundary. And if your boundary is wider than what universal co-masonry is, it doesn't mean that you're wrong. It just means that maybe we're too, we're too narrow for you. Likewise, if you're super narrow and you're within our boundaries, you may be uncomfortable because we're not narrow enough. And there's never a set place that, you know, universal co-masonry has to go to because we will never get everyone. And that's not the point. The point is to set boundaries and say, you, you need to be a moral person which means you probably should figure out what your morality is based on and why you make the decisions that you do. And if you believe in an objective universe, there are rights and wrongs in this world. And Freemasonry adamantly asserts that there is right and wrong. So if that doesn't jive, then, you know, there's, there's an issue there. Um, Sound judgment. Again, that goes back to the mature age. Like, you know, are you making good decisions? Are you um, being very, I want to say stoic, but you can use stoic if you want, but, very contemplative and firm in your convictions that your judgment isn't a house built on sand, but on cement or on a ground that is solid. Um, you, one thing you'll find, especially in masonry, the ceremony that makes you a member or a mason is initiation. It changes you on all different levels, and it can be a very disruptive force if your foundation is extremely rocky. So one of the things that we look for is just to make sure that everything is pretty firm. Like not that you're stuck and you can't change, right? It's not that it has to be so rigid that you can't have a different idea come in, but that you're firm, that everything is sitting firm and that you can start going into this world of exploration and investigation without doing do harm to yourself. So if you have a mental illness, which I know in modern times that has become more expansive um, and it's incorporation, that does not exclude you from being a Mason. What we will ask is, are you, you know, what are you doing to take care of that illness? Because it is an illness that you need to address to help you be better and founded on your, on your ground so that you can make good decision. So sound judgment, strict morals, um, mature age, upright, and free, upright and free. A lot of these kind of dovetail into each other. Upright means that you are honest in all your interactions. So if you're, you know, I'm interviewing you and you're telling me how you scam someone out of some whatever, like that's not upright um, by my standards or anyone's standards. So when we're looking at upright, we're looking at individuals who really want to do well with those around them, that they really, no matter what the other person is doing, they're trying to do what is right. And they're trying to interact with that person on a very, um, when I say righteous, I don't mean in a Christian or religious sense, but in a righteous, like in a very moral way is the best way to say it. So um, upright, again, that you're very honest, that you're you're following your principles. I may not agree with all of your morality, but I do appreciate when you're acting on your morality, meaning that you're upright on your system. So I'm not going to sit down and be like, all right, brother, Aurora, tell me about your morality, and I'm going to tell you I disagree with all of it, and then I'm not going to let you in. No, I'm going to see... If you're telling me that this is what morality is, and then this is what how you're living, I'm going to compare it based off of who you are. I'm not going to base it off of what I think you should do, because my opinion doesn't matter in that case. So I'm checking it from a very objective standpoint. There have been times that I've interviewed people where I'm just like, man, I, I do not like their idea of how morality is at all. And I have still voted for their in favor of them being a member. Because I'm not looking for all the same people like me. God help us. <laughs> it all makes sure it was me. Um, you know, hey, you weren't supposed to laugh so hard. Um, but when you look at it, you you have to look at the person at where they are. So an example is someone says, you know, I think that you should be very healthy and, you know, great in how you treat your physical body and other people. And then, um, you know, they light a cigarette up in front of me. I will actually ask you about that. I will actually say, why are you smoking if you think that you need to be healthy? I mean, I don't think you should smoke anyway, but I'm not asking because of what I think. I'm just predicating my answers off of, you know, my questions rather off of what you said. So, um, and, that, and that's important. And that's why fraternity is important because you get to know people and you have conversations. Well, do you think this is moral? Or what do you think the right thing should do? And you'll get some different answers because people are very different on where their parameters are. And then free. Um, this is one of the things that, is historical that irritates me. And there's some, and this is one of the things that's more, um, what's the word? It's more speculative. Um, so the historical part is back in the day, people said you had to be like free, like sovereign of yourself, not a slave 
or a woman um, uh, that was property of her husband. We live in the 21st century and most women are free and most men are free. So we're not talking about a physical freedom from someone else being your, your master, if you will, or you know the husband in the terms of a master. What we are looking at, are you free to make your decisions as you need to? Um, we've had some past examples where someone said, well, you know, we asked a question. Well, I need to ask my, you know, I wasn't a pastor, but I'll use that word. You know, I have to ask my pastor if I can do that. Well, if you can't make the decision by yourself, then then you need to stay where you're at because I don't know why you're looking anyway, um, because you're having someone else make your decisions for you. That doesn't mean you can't get counsel. That doesn't mean you can't talk with people. You know, you can't go, you can go home to your spouse and say, hey, you know, what, what should I do in this situation? Um, but when someone is dictating your remove, that tends to be tricky. Now, in universal co-masonry and mixed orders across the globe, that's the one thing that's uh, unique to us is we get a lot of spouses in masonry. And so, you know, one spouse wants to join and the other one necessarily doesn't. But the other one comes because they have to go together and do everything um, together. There's a beauty in that. But there's also you have to understand that, like, my husband's a mason. But in masonry, he's a brother first and a husband second. And that's that has been something I've had to learn over 20 years of what that looks like. You know, there's been conversations where we're talking and once, you know, could be either one of us and saying, it's like, I'm not asking you as a spouse. I'm having a conversation as a brother. And that changes the context because there's a whole world of hierarchy in masonry. And it's, you know, it's not based on gender. It's based on merit because we're a meritocracy. We're based on your ability to do what you can do, not what someone else can do. So it does change things. So if you're not free to make your decisions, then this wouldn't be a good fit for you because you're going to be having to make lots of decisions as you do in everyday life. And if you can't do that without constantly consulting someone else, that doesn't work. Um, And it creates a lot of tension. And the people that have said, no, 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 I'm fine. And then they weren't end up leaving because it was too much tension and it broke. The last type of freedom is um, freedom of addiction. Addictions look different for every single person and addictions can be extreme and they can be minor, but they're still addictions. So we're looking at, you know, are you in possession of your own self or do you have to have something to, you know, aid you for your better? Um, And it it doesn't, you know, someone can say, well, we're all addicted to food. I'm like, I'm not talking about like addict, like I have to have a meal at least once a day else I'll die. I'm not talking about that extreme idea. I'm talking about, you know, um, I, drinking is one, of course, drinking alcohol, sex and pornography is one, um, addiction to drama. That's another one, which is a sleeper hit. You know, most people aren't aware of it. And then it just takes out a whole room. You know, if you're addicted to constantly causing trauma and drama on other people, that's an addiction. And you're not going to ever get better if you're constantly trying to feed that monster. So, um, that's another interpretation of free, which opens up the idea that when you're being interviewed by these brothers, there's a lot of interpretation that goes on into it. And that's okay because we know it's on the other side of the door of initiation and we know what's coming if you are to join and how would that best interact. And we will discuss like, you know, I think that this individual would be great. I think this are going to be some of their struggles and that, you know, we need to be mindful of, or, you know, I think this person is great, but I don't think it's their time. I think they need to work on X, Y, and Z and then come to the door of initiation. I've seen that plenty of times where we've come back and said, you're not ready. You need to work on whatever it is and then and then come back to us and, you know, and see where we're at and see if you're ready. And the brothers that have done that, who have walked that path specifically, ha- are much better off because we prepared them as we should for what was coming ahead. And so it's just been like, go ahead and we'll just kind of fix it as we go. And that just makes it traumatic for everyone. So those are the requirements. Just, upright, and free of sound judgment, strict morals, and mature age. Um, any questions on that? We're almost out of time. So, okay. No questions from any of the forms? Oh, no, we have lots of questions. Let's just pop it. Brother Christopher. I didn't, he lowered his hand. I did not lower his hand. Okay. Brother Christopher. I did lower my hand. Thank you, Brother Katie. Um, you've brought up a lot of good points as far as a lot of things I've heard just within the last week or so, um, such as women cannot be Masons. That was the first rule that I heard, such as 
other things, they didn't quite follow the same trajectory. And I'm asking you, what other things does universal Freemasonry offer? Where maybe what the Freemasonry that have led many people here haven't thought about. You know, Brother Christopher, I appreciate that question. I've never been asked that question. So I have to think for a second. Um, I will start out by saying, because Brother Christopher brought up the distinction of what people are, I hate calling them um, regular masonry or traditional masonry because I, I don't know what that means. Um, we call them all male masons or male craft. So um, the difference, you know, there's there's like some technical differences, like they, you know, just met men, we met men and women. There, there's that, but that's not what I'm going to talk about. Um, they're they're the largest. The all male order is the largest on the planet, and that's why you've heard of them and not not of the others um, necessarily. But what Universal Co Masonry has is a genuine family that's committed. Like, I don't know what your backgrounds, and I'm going to say you, I'm not just talking about Brother Christopher, I'm talking about everyone on whatever platform you're coming in on. Um, I don't know what your background is, but like, I, I sat in a church where it was congregational when I was growing up, and no one knew if I, you know, my parents knew I was missing if I wasn't there, but like, no one else knew, and no one else cared. They'd just be like, yeah, she's not here. Um, masonry is not that at all. Like, universal commissioning, it's a family. And that's why I wouldn't say it's speed dating because I think that's irreligious to the whole interview process, but it is a process of trying to get to know you to see if this can be a, you know, can you come into the family and fit well? Um, because when, when you're not at lodge, like you're missed and it's not, no one sits there and guilt you and it's like, you know, brother Christopher, where were you now? If we don't see you for a while, we'll check in and say, Hey, we're really worried about you. We haven't seen you in a couple of months. Is everything going all right, you know, it's, some brothers, it just depends. It's like, I haven't seen you in like a week. Is everything fine? You know, like, it just depends on who you are, but it's a family. And that's something that um, male craft doesn't offer. And it's not just a, a family of one gender. It's a family of multiple, like individual families to make a bigger family. So you have brother Patrick, who's a Lewis, you know, his uh, mother's in masonry. Um, my husband's parents are in masonry. His aunt's in masonry. His brother's in masonry. So you have a lot of like individual families that make up the conglomerate. And then you have a singletons who are like, I have like no masonry in my family. And I just showed up on the scene and they let me in, you know, and they're like, you fit and you, this will be great for you. And I fit and I found a family and I found people who genuinely care for me. That's not to say that I'm sure there's people in masonry who don't like me. I'm, I'm not naive, um, but we're brothers. You, you don't have to like me, but we do respect each other, you know, and if there's a conflict, there is a resolution to it. So if we're at odds with each other, we just don't take, this is my, my rug that I use for my mouse pad. You know, we don't just like put it under the rug and, and no one talks about it. Like we are trained, we are disciplined into confronting people nicely saying, hey, you know, brother um, Patrick, I don't know if you meant to do this, but it really upset me or, you know, hey, my feelings really hurt or, you know, someone, you know, we had a convention just recently and someone was really down and I saw brothers going over to him and it wasn't like a dramatic way. It was just brothers who knew him was like, hey, you seem kind of down. Are you all right? You want to talk about it? You know, and that's something you can get in male craft masonry, but it's not as intimate and it's not as consistent. Because in male craft mastering, you have people that, you know, they, they leave and then you don't see them for a long, long time. And sometimes they never come back. Um, we do have people that leave, obviously, and people that don't come back after long periods of time. But it's much smaller because we work really hard to let people know that they're they're important. You know, not just because you can sit and lodge and do ritual work. I mean, but like you're important because you're a human being and we miss you. So I would say the community is very, very different. Um, because it is more familial, it's more, we're in a common direction, even though like the perfection of humanity. So we have to the glory of God and to the perfection of humanity. So I'm like, okay, you know, we have three brothers in here. It's like, well, what is the perfection of humanity? Like I said, multiply it by four and we'll have 12 different answers between the three of us of what that means. That means ultimately that every single human being who's working for the perfection of humanity has a place in perfecting humanity. And that we're going to do it differently. It's like it's like the light. There's seven colors in the visible spectrum of light that if you are missing one, doesn't create light. You have to have all of them. And so there is that familial group and community that allows you the space to be you, yet challenge you, challenges you to be a better you, if that makes sense. That's another thing that I would say is very different 
um, and the love of ritual. I've been I've been to male craft lodges. I've sat in an installation of officers and I've been visitors for like lectures and stuff like that. Um, and I've had other brothers who have, you know, they've affiliated from another obedience and they'll say like, we do ritual work really, really well. And I don't say that in hubris. I say that in objectivity. We work very hard to make sure our ritual looks very good. And that's not something you will see in a lot of the other obediences. I've been to some um, obediences overseas that came close, but I wouldn't say that they really were like on point with the, the ritual. And we we work very hard to make sure the ritual is as it says it should be. So that would be another one. Is there anything else you guys can think of that's different? No? Um, I'm sure there are maybe a few other points. Outside of the, the, the biggest one, which I feel like I've been talking about, and maybe that's why I didn't say anything, is that we have a we're spiritual, 100%. Spiritual, spiritual, spiritual. Um, and what I mean by spiritual, I mean philosophical, I mean mental, I mean everything. That is where we're like fundamentally just different. Um, we don't have long business meetings. Like we try to do as much business outside of lodge, and that lodge is meant for instruction and education and ritual work. Um we are very much interested in trying to uncover what nature wants us to uncover and what that looks like. And that's the fundamental difference between the two. Um, male craft tends to be more of a uh, philanthropic. It's sometimes depending on the obedience. It can be more of like a gentleman's club if it's all male. A female tend to be more um, civic if they are, you know, more less spiritual, they tend to be more civic reform. So there's a little bit of difference in there, but we're definitely intellectual, spiritual, philosophically different in how we approach things. I hope that helps, Brother Christopher. Um, Anthony. Then you have uh, a comment and two questions in okay. uh, YouTube. Okay, we'll go to Anthony and then comments and two questions in YouTube. Yes, yeah, thank you. Um, we've uh, touched on this in the past and um, mm -hmm. I, I want to try to see if we can maybe clarify it a little bit, not just for myself, but potentially for others. Um, and that would be on the uh, issue of the physical requirements, specifically as it regards to disabled folks. Now, I don't want to make this a legal issue because it's my yeah. understanding that you're a private club and you can exclude anyone you'd like for any reasons. Mm -hmm. um, you've, You've touched on before that you you don't allow people in a wheelchair, and and that's a hard hard aspect, and that's that's a line in the sand. Unfortunately, disability is a lot broader than just folks in wheelchairs or not, as I'm sure most people know, yourself included. Um, specifically, let's say, what about blind folks? What about people that have difficulty speaking? Uh, earlier, you referenced. Uh, Dyslexia, that's considered a learning disability. What about people that are missing a limb but are mobile? What about people that need a little bit of mobility assistance? I, I don't want you to have to touch on everything, but it's, you know, there's there's a lot of gray there. I'm, I'm sure you know. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Anthony. Um, so Anthony is correct. There is a physical requirement. Um, and the, the requirement is you have to be able to do ritual work in its fullest. Um, and that means you have to do uh, the signs, scripts, and tokens. That means you have to be able to move around the lodge. That means you have to be able to do things physically. You have to kneel. You have to stand. Um, not that we do this anymore, but the longest Masonic meeting I've ever been in it was six hours, and you can't go to the bathroom, and you don't have a break, and you don't go get lunch, and you don't hang out with your buddies and tell you, you know, like, you sit very disciplined, and six hours is a long time even for those who are in their in their peak efficiency. Um, so you have to be able to sit for long periods of time. You have to stand for long periods of time. And so if you have a physical element that doesn't allow you to do that, then masonry is not for you. And, I know, and I've had people very upset about this, and I get it, because there is wonderful people who want to be masons, who would be great masons, but because they have this physical, um, I wouldn't even say an obstacle, because it's more than that, this physical determinant, they can't. And unfortunately, it, there, as Anthony said, it's a line in the sand that you have to be able to do ritual. Now, um, you know, you spoke specifics and about like blind or need assistance with speaking. Um, I've never sat in lodge with a blind individual. Not to say that people haven't gotten old 
and, um, you know, they've lost their sight. That's a different story because they know what's going on. They've seen what's going on for years. And then, you know, age takes, takes your capacities away. Um, but I've never sat in lodge with someone who was, you know, initiated in a wheelchair, never sat in lodge with someone who's completely deaf. Now we have brothers who have like hearing aids, they can hear and it's non-intrusive. Um, and that has been difficult for them in their own ways because, you know, there's a lot of speaking. There's a lot, you know, the, the lodges are different sizes depending where you're at. And it can be great acoustics or it can be terrible. There's a lot of noise. There's no noise. It can be very chaotic at times. And so, you know, there are, there are, I wouldn't say exceptions. There are things that just like blind, there's no way you can become a, a mason in universal masonry if you're coming in completely blind. You can't see what you're doing. And that doesn't, um, doesn't connect with the ritual the way it should connect. And I know that doesn't explain a lot, but for Masons would understand what I'm trying to say. Um, with, you know, people in wheelchairs who need walking assistance, like crutches and whatnot. Um, again, you have to be able to do the ritual. So outside of the legal stuff, because I think, you know, to your point, Anthony, I think that's a, like, a very easy fallback. It's like, well, legally we can discriminate whoever we want. You know, it's, I don't, it's irrelevant. Um, you know, yeah, we have a tax status that allows us to do that. But it's more to the fact that it, it excludes you automatically from being fully integrated into the work. And from brothers who have I have talked to who have lost their capacities in whatever way due to age or accident, they tell you how isolating it is. And they feel very separated. And they're, they become, I wouldn't say they're all miserable. and That's you know, not it at all. But they do feel a sense of loss. It's a death in its own way. And they feel very, very excluded despite the fact that all of us still love them and still, you know, we still are, you know, they're our brother. Like we would never forsake you no matter what happens. They still feel very isolated because they can't do the work the way they need to in order to connect with the ritual. So Anthony, I appreciate you bringing that up because I, I had not thought to talk about it tonight, but it is important. Um, someone has applied, you know, in the past that has a pretty profound limp, but they were able to do what they needed to do to do the ritual work and they were fine. So just because you have a physical ailment, it kind of goes with the mental health. Like just because you have something that's physically or mentally, you know, not in working order doesn't mean that you're fully excluded. Now there are some mental health that are beyond our capability that we would never permit. Um, and I can't think of something off the top of my head, but you know, that says like if someone was schizophrenic and did not take care of themselves and was not doing what they needed to do. Like we would never allow you into the masonry. Not because we, we don't like you or think you're a great person, because the work that the mental and spiritual work that that enacts upon you, it's it's hard for those who have their capabilities together and to put someone else in that danger who doesn't. Unfortunately, we had someone lie on their application. It does happen. And that brother, it was a terrible experience for the brother. It was terrible for the lodge because we're not licensed care. You know, we don't we're not psychologists and therapists. We don't know how to take care of that. And we don't pretend to. And that was a really hard experience. Um, and I know that because I was the master of that lodge when that happened. And it was very, very difficult. Um, and it didn't turn out well for the brother, unfortunately, because we just didn't know. And the brother wasn't honest. Likewise, with the physical part, there is, as brother, or as I, Anthony, you've been here for so long, I call you brother. Um, as, uh, as Anthony said, there is a big space in the middle. There's definitely a line in the sand, but there's a lot of gray leading up to it. And it's just a case by case basis um, on whether or not it would work uh, with that. All right, we have um, questions with YouTube, and then we'll go to Devin, and then we are out of time. You guys have great questions tonight. Let's go ahead. So first, there's a comment from Johnny Warren. He says, yes, we are definitely more, more esoteric. What's up, brother Johnny? I haven't heard Johnny, it. Yeah, I haven't heard his name in a long time. Hey, brother Johnny. Okay, yeah, we are definitely more spiritual. Um, then uh, I have a question from Reba Agaman. Is there an age cutoff? Ah, age cutoff. No, no, there's no age cutoff. You just have to be 21 at least if you're not a Lewis. Um, we have people come in their 80s. I don't know if we've ever had anyone in their 90s, but that doesn't mean they can't be a first. Again, you just have to be in your, your capacity, both physical, mental, and spiritual. And that would be the only requirement. Next question. Uh, question from Alejandro Amico. Can we consider the works of Niccolo Machiavelli morally right? Ooh, Ooh. that's a whole nother meeting. Can we consider Machiavelli right? Um, you know, I've never read the, the um, 
I'm going to say the little prince. That is not it. Yes. <laughs> It is the, uh, the Prince. The Prince. And don't put the little in there because that's a completely different story. Um, the Prince. I've never read The Prince, but I am familiar with Machiavelli. Uh, you know, that is a great question to sit down and ask people about. Um, does Universal Comedy have a stance? No, uh, it doesn't work that way. But I would delve deep into the understanding of Machiavelli's morality um, and see where it sits and where it goes and how it was applied. The question I would beg to answer or ask rather is, was it's not so much was Machiavelli moral, but was he ethical? So did he follow his principles of morality in the way that he conducted himself with other people, which is the definition of ethics in the modern sense? Um, so I can't answer that in zero minutes um, because that's such a deep question. But I would love to sit down and just have a conversation on your interpretations of his his actions and his morality and what you think morality is and what you think nature is trying to teach us what morality is not the the, the answer you wanted but definitely the answer i'm going to give because i can't tell you yes or no but masonry itself does not have a stance on that um in any way so that's more of a, a coffee conversation for a bunch of brothers uh sitting down and having a conversation about that so sorry i can answer it more direct all right Devin, you are the last question on the docker or last comment it is all you. This goes back to uh, one of your other um, meetings when you said, uh, what does co-masonry have to offer? And what I found enlightening was the way you break down um, the teachings. So in male craft, I guess, you know, you eventually break off and you choose Scottish right or English right. Mm -hmm. But in universal masonry is linear. You, you know, get a better foundation and a whole picture, really. You know, you learn more and you get the whole thing, the whole aspect of it. So I found that, you know, really interesting, the whole red, white, and blue morality of it aspect. And I think, Devin, to your point, that ties into actually um, Brother Aurora's comment about can you join other obediences? Not that it doesn't happen, because it does happen, but most people when they when they are in universal co-masonry, they don't tend to go outside for like different things because it's so expansive. And as you said, like, you know, we just go like the whole story is parsed out over a series of degrees that really it, it holds you and your attention and your spiritual growth and your physical growth in an accordance. And you have a bunch of people who have those same degrees or near those same degrees, and you can have a conversation. Where when you go to other obediences and you have to go outside of their blue lodge to go get the Scottish or English right, you don't necessarily have that same bond because you weren't initiated necessarily with them or you didn't, you know, the story might be a little different depending on your jurisdictions and all that. So um, we do have people who do go to other, they, you know, they add Rosicrucianism or uh, Martinism in, or you can even say theosophy if you want to throw that in there. But they tend to not actually go to other Masonic obediences because we have a really just really a complete story of what masonry is trying to do. And so there's not an overall like a, a compulsion to go find more, you know, like this, this doesn't make sense. I, I need to go find something that's missing. It's, it's already in there. And so that kind of dovetails a little bit into what Aurora was saying. Um, but yeah, it's one consecutive ladder. So if someone's a 30th degree and they're talking to another, another 30th degree in our order, they have the same degrees. And so they can have a very robust conversation for a really long time over a lot of stuff. Um, and the nice thing is, is we have a lifetime together. So we have a lifetime to have all those conversations. And um, that's not something that you necessarily, to Brother Christopher's comment and question, it's not something you necessarily get in other obediences because you do have to make other communities to fill in the gaps. So thank you for that, Devin. And Patrick's the last one. I said Devin was call it Patrick. Patrick. Uh, another question in the, chat, in the chat, Anthony McFadden asks what the financial requirements are. Ah, financial requirements. Um, very good question. Uh, financial requirements. So depending on the lodge, lodges set their own application fee, but they tend to be $100. Miami is $150 and Denver is $200, just so you know, um, if you're coming from any of those places. Um, so application fees are roughly $100 or higher, depending. It's a one-time application fee that's due when your application is submitted. It's non-refundable. So please keep that in mind and when you take the dive and apply. Um, and then you, if you are accepted, so that's the only money that is uh, that is required for the application process and all this stuff. 
once you're accepted, you have we we have a uniform that we wear. Speaking of regalia and discipline, and to Devon's point, military, we have a uniform. Everyone wears the same uniform. So if you want to go get a Jimmy Choo outfit, it's not going to work because we don't offer Jimmy Choo at our distribution services. You have to wear the same uniform as us. So it's all white. We don't wear black and white. We don't wear all black. We wear all white. That includes our shoes. And so there is a one-time financial obligation of buying your clothes. Um, and with each degree, there are different things you put on with that. That is yours to keep, but you would have to buy that. So if you go into the second degree, you would buy something and usually includes like your reading materials and stuff. You'd buy that and it's yours um, and so forth and so on. So there's in that uniform, as I said, everyone in the order wears it. So if you're visiting a lodge in Manila, then you would wear the uniform. You know, if you're visiting a lodge in Croatia, you would wear the uniform. It would all be the same, which is really nice because you don't have to worry about the different dress codes because there isn't one. There's just one. The um, reoccurring fees, there are two. There is dues. Those are also set by the lodge. Um, and so depending on what lodge you're applying to, you have yearly dues. Uh, I, I know in, in San Francisco, our dues are a little higher because we have to pay for our space and no one thinks San Francisco is cheap. So, you know, it's pretty pricey rent and it's pretty pricey uh, fees. And so we have to pay that. So our dues are a little higher. Larkspur, which is where our, our international headquarters is, Larkspur, Colorado, United States, um, the dues are set very low because we have people from all over the world and, you know, a dollar for a dollar is not the same. So the headquarters lodge in Larkspur has a very set fee um, that's much lower than most lodges just because we have so many brothers in places where, you know, the U.S. dollar is much is valued much higher than maybe their local currency. That's a recurring fee. That's once every year, depending on which lodge you apply to. The last fee is that you donate based off of what you think you can donate to what we call benevolence. So if a brother is in need and requires assistance, financial assistance, the lodge can um, support in whatever, like, let's say it's uh, a grocery bill or no, it's an electrical bill. Let's say they're having problems with their electrical bill. The lodge would take the electrical bill, pay that electrical bill from that, that um, benevolence fund, and then that brother's okay. Now we don't, sustain brothers like they that's just like a one-time thing or two-time thing that's not like something that happens all the time if a brother is sick um we have we have families so we have brothers who have kids and so there might be um, a donation from the lodge to give them a baby gift if there's that so that benevolence is something that it's not a set rate it's whatever you are capable of donating so one time it might be you're tight and it's only twenty dollars or a dollar Another time you're plenty and you can do more than that, then you do it. No one sits there and goes, all right, Brother Jill, what did you donate? You know, and like record it, you know, um, there's there's none of that. People donate according to their means. So there's that. Um, and with that donation, there's also, uh, you know, we have to buy stuff like spiritual work doesn't carry itself. So there's a material component where we have to buy candles and incense and, you know, ritualistic items that you, you'll need and the lodge pays for that. So some of my contribution will go for the t welfare of my lodge, or, you know, it could be my community. The lodge can choose to, you know, sponsor a family for a holiday, whether it's Hanukkah or Christmas, whatever, and, you know, buy them presents. They can do that if they want, um, if they have extra money, or they can um, donate to anything they want. And then the other one is more just the maintenance, making sure that the lodge has the dues also help with that, but the dues are usually they don't cover it all. So I'll just recap that you have the application fee, you have the uniform fee, you have um, donations for benevolence and then donation and care for the lodge and then the dues. And those are all based on like. What one lodge does in one country is very different in another. like our lodges in South America has you know, very different uh inflation rates than we do here in the U.S. or in Kenya or wherever. So um, that is definitely determined at a local level. If you're curious about wherever you're applying, you can email me and I can let you know. I think I'm out of time. The one last thing I will say before I bid you adieu and I sign us off and tell you what we're going to do next month. Um, if you want to apply or have questions about your application, um, you can say on afterwards, Brother Patrick and Jill and I can get you taken care of. Um, if you have questions about the application, all that good stuff, we'll be here for the next five to 10 minutes. And then, um, we can assist you with that. 
What we're going to do next time is I am working because he's most difficult to schedule is Brother Matthias to come in and do a presentation on the theology of Freemasonry. I highly recommend it. It's very hard for me to get him in the door here. So uh, hopefully he can do it. I think it will be a good way to end the year for us is talking about the theology. He may shake it up on me and do politics of Freemasonry. So it's one of those two. Uh, But I highly recommend that you join us because either one is phenomenal. And I don't just say it because I like the guy. It's true. They're really, really good. Um, And if you can't make it because I understand the holidays, hopefully you can catch a recording on YouTube or Facebook. So with that, I think, Brother Patrick, we're all good and squared away. I want to thank you all for coming and spending your time with us. And we will see you in one month's time on the second Monday, if you're in North America, at 6 p.m. If you're in the Philippines, that is Tuesday morning, because you're already into the next day at 9 a.m. So hopefully you'll be able to join us from wherever you're coming in. Thank you and have a wonderful night. And if you have any questions about applications and whatnot, let me know, stay on, and then we'll go back to our regularly scheduled program in December. Have a good night.